Hi, I'm Leela Brammer. I'm director of the Parsia Program for Public Discourse here at the University of Chicago. The program aims to build the capacity for contributing to and fostering open, robust, and inclusive inquiry and discourse. Today, we are absolutely thrilled to have Nadine Strassen with us as our inaugural speaker. Uh, joining her this afternoon in conversation are Matthew Pinna, a second year political science major, and Eleanor Citron, a first year economics major. Uh, at the end of the program, we'll open it up for questions. We'll have a mic um, toward the back. Uh, and at the end, Professor Strassen will be around to sign copies of her book that are available for the, from the seminary co-op out in the hallway. Um, I am gonna turn it over to Ellie now to introduce Professor Strassen. Thank you, Leila. I am proud and honored to introduce Professor Nadine Strassen, the writer of Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship. Strassen was the first female president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008, and is now currently the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law at New York Law School. She has been published over 300 times, writing prolifically as both scholar and activist. Professor Strassen's work has received much critical acclaim. In 2017, she was the recipient of the American Bar Association's Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award, the National Law Journal's The 100 Most Influential Lawyers in America, and Vanity Fair's America's 200 Most Influential Women, amongst many others. Last spring, I met Nadine when she came to my hometown of Baltimore to present at my public library on her book, similar to what she is doing today. In her talk, she discussed the misunderstandings surrounding free speech ideals, distinctions between hate speech and free speech, and the virtues of the First Amendment in promoting values of equity and justice. Since then, I have often thought about the sentiments which Nadine so thoughtfully expressed, especially at the University of Chicago, a school committed to robust, open inquiry and discourse. Nadine's work particularly piqued my interest and has definitely contributed to my pursuance of the human rights minor here at the college. Afterwards, I had the opportunity to talk with Nadine over dinner. In our conversation, I was struck by her willingness and excitement to hear what I had to say about concepts of speech and equity. It became increasingly clear just how much she cares about the real world manifestations of her work, how we think about speech, and not just for the adults who regulate it, but rather for everyone. As you will all soon learn, Nadine is incredibly earnest and gracious. It is only so often that you get to meet such a superstar, someone so inspiring, successful, and down to earth. And it is only so often that such people exist. I feel truly lucky to know Nadine and to have this opportunity to continue our conversation here at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Nadine Strasser. Aww. Oh, so <laughs> thank you for that great introduction. Awesome. But <laughs> Well, Professor Strassen, thank you again for joining oh, us. I think we can be on a first name basis. Oh, Is that okay? That's fine with me. May I call you Matthew? Yes, you may. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Nadine, thank you for joining us. And so for those in the room who might not be familiar with your book, which is Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship, could you provide us with a brief overview of your thesis? Yes. Uh, my thesis is that free speech and equality are mutually reinforcing rather than antagonistic as has recently been claimed. And this is a conviction that I have, Matthew and Ellie, not only through my own experience of decades of activism, but also through looking at the track record of other countries that have censored hate speech in the hope of advancing equality. And let me start by saying I am profoundly committed to the goals of those who advocate censoring hate speech. Equality, diversity, dignity, inclusivity, societal harmony, um, mental health for individuals. But I am absolutely convinced that even if censorship, even though censorship is well intended, it does not effectively advance those goals. And the only effective way of doing that is through robust free speech that is sufficiently robust to extend even to the thought that we hate, to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, so you talked about how you 
this in several countries. And so the First Amendment is definitely very unique when it comes to America. Can you talk generally about what exactly is protected under the First Amendment when it comes to freedom of speech? Absolutely. And my book deliberately is not based on the First Amendment alone. I do think that First Amendment principles make a great deal of common sense and strategically are actually effective in promoting not only individual liberty and democracy, but also equality. Uh, so I advocate that for those reasons, other countries and to some extent, private sector entities, including certain pri certainly private universities, which are not literally constrained by the First Amendment, should voluntarily choose to follow First Amendment principles. Mm -hmm. uh, so the basic principles really are two. And I teach a whole course on First Amendment law, and it's incredibly complicated and convoluted and even incoherent and inconsistent to some extent. But you can, without oversimplifying, you can basically simplify First Amendment free speech principles to two core principles. One is called the viewpoint or content neutrality principle. And that is that government must remain neutral with respect to the content, the viewpoint, the message, the idea that is conveyed by speech. No matter how much you may dislike, even loathe that content or message, find it deeply repugnant, that is not alone a justification for censoring it. That we have to instead use counter speech and other non-sensorial measures to counter ideas that we loathe. But the counterpart principle, which is often called the emergency principle, is that in a, when you get beyond content, the idea or the message of the speech, and you look at the context, the overall facts and circumstances, speech with any message, including a hateful one, may in a particular context be punished. And that is when it directly causes certain serious, specific, imminent harms. And the only way to prevent those harms is through censoring the speech. And the Supreme Court has recognized a number of categories that satisfy the emergency principle. One would be a true threat when the speaker intends to instill a reasonable fear on the part of the audience to whom the message is targeted, a reasonable fear that they will be subject to harm. Another example is intentional incitement of imminent violence, where the violence is likely to happen imminently. Another example is targeted harassment or bullying. And if I could make one other point, um, we often hear the terms hate speech, and I put that in quotation marks, by the way, all the way through my book, just to underscore the fact that the Supreme Court has never recognized a category of speech based on its hateful content and label it hate speech and said, therefore, it's excluded from First Amendment protection. But there is a legally recognized concept of hate crimes, sometimes called bias crimes. And that's really important because I do support that concept, and I think it really does advance goals of equality and non-discrimination. That is, if you have an action that is independently a crime, having nothing to do with any ideas or expressions, such as an assault on a person or vandalism of property, if the victim of that crime is singled out based on a discriminatory reason, such as a racial discrimination or gender discrimination or religion, then it can be treated as a more serious crime hmm. on the theory that it does more harm to the individual victim, to the victim's community, the group to which he or she belongs, and to society as a whole, and it can and should receive an increased punishment. Hmm. Hmm. So essentially you're saying that there's a distinction between speech that espouses hate and speech that calls for like a direct uh, violence? Uh, speech that directly causes certain specific imminent serious harm. And to, as the Supreme Court has said, even to advocate for violence or some other Ill illegal conduct 
is protected. Mm -hmm. It's only when you cross that line from advocacy to intentional incitement that is imminently going to happen. Now, I recognize, and the Supreme Court certainly recognizes, that speech that can still cause harm, even if it doesn't have such a direct and imminent connection, but the danger of allowing government to punish speech or to suppress it because of fear of a more attenuated, speculative, indirect connection to potential harm is that that basically gives the government license to pick ideas that it dislikes and to suppress them. As Oliver Wendell Holmes said, dissenting from this looser test that we used to have before the emergency principle was called the bad tendency test. Any speech that had a tendency to possibly lead to dangerous ideas, which might possibly lead to dangerous conduct, could be punished. And surprise, surprise, it was under that standard that any speech that was critical of the government was endangered. Certainly, any socialist and communist speech was punished, any anti war dissident speech. This is why Martin Luther King wrote his famous letter from the Birmingham jail. This is why Margaret Sanger and Emma Gold than were in prison for giving women information about uh, birth control. So that uh, d demanding that tight and imminent connection is really, really crucial. And so how do you think we should begin to think about making you know, those distinctions, aside from the fact that you know, we do have you know, we are able to distinguish between, you know, speech that's simply hateful mm -hmm. and speech that calls for direct action against mm -hmm. targeted groups. Well, in fairness, the standard uh, that the emergency standard is extremely hard to satisfy, but sadly, it is satisfied by a lot of examples of hateful speech that we see, including on college campuses. And I think this is important because when I read um, essays by uh, law professors who argue that the United States should move more in the direction of other countries that allow hate speech to be punished, they'll give examples of hateful speech. And nine times out of 10, it is already punishable under the concepts that I've laid out. So, you know, it, it's really a common sense um, approach. The speech that is like, that does pose the greatest harm, is threat of harm, is already punishable. But censorship that poses the greatest harm is outlawed. And the greatest harm of censorship is that government is trying to suppress certain ideas, right? So let me give you an example from a campus. It's a tragic situation that occurred at the American University a couple of years ago. Uh, a, a young woman, African-American woman, what Taylor Dumpson, was elected as the first African-American female student body president at American University in Washington, DC. And on the day that she was taking office, distributed around the campus were a series of bananas that were slung in nooses. And on the bananas were written the initials of her sorority, which is a predominantly African-American sorority. Uh, there's no doubt that that satisfies the standard of a true threat, right? Intended to instill in a reasonable person a fear of being subject to attack. And in fact, it uh, did impose a, you know, great fear, not only on her part, but that of other African American and other minority students on the campus. Moreover, it was not only a true threat that is punishable, but because she was singled out on the basis of race and perhaps gender, uh, it was treated as, as a hate crime. So I think that's a really good illustration of where speech crosses the line. On the other hand, uh, I'm constantly hearing rhetoric from, I should use the word rhetoric, 
carefully. You both are stunning and are experts, but <laughs> I constantly hear uh, assertions from uh, campuses that I feel so threatened by the fact that Steve Bannon has been invited to do a debate at the University of Chicago. So that loose concept of feeling uncomfortable or threatened in some abstract sense is not going to justify government censorship. Yes, there could be his ideas deserve refutation, but that's different from suppression and punishment. So you bring up the University of Chicago, and of course what comes with that is the well-known Chicago principles on free expression. Um, and for the students in the audience, this was expounded upon in a letter that was given to the class of 2020. So uh, Nadine, two questions. What are your personal opinions on the Chicago principles on free expression? And two, how do you think those principles uh, really changed how other colleges view the protection of free speech? You know, I will be very specific and very personal about it. I first saw the Chicago principles when they had just been drafted uh, in a report uh, by a committee chaired by my longtime friend and colleague, Jeff Stone, who was the editor not only of the series in which my book appeared, but he actually personally edited my book and did a <laughs> phenomenal job. He was really tough. I mean, I learned that words can hurt. <laughs> but um, Jeff and I had both spoken at a conference at Drake Law School on a completely different subject. And um, as we were flying back, he texted, he emailed me the draft report. He said, I think you're, let me know what you think. And I cannot forget how excited and inspired I was. I didn't even know that this had been in the works. And it is such an eloquent mm. statement of such timeless principles. But what was really important was a, a point that I try to make in my book as well, really understanding the impetus, the positive impetus to challenge those free speech principles. You know, civility and equality and mutual respect are such important values. And inclusivity and diversity and harmony within the university community are such important values. And the, the principles recognize that but say that we may not sacrifice free speech to promote those concerns. We have to, uh, we may not censor free speech to, to promote those concerns, but rather we can promote them through education and through more speech. I think that every university should adopt some version of the Chicago principles. I say some version because it starts with some wonderful history that's specific to your university, which is justly proud for having a long tradition of supporting free speech. And I think what's really important for students now who often see free speech principles invoked by those on the right end of the political spectrum is the history of Robert Maynard Hutchins when he was president um, allowing uh, communists, leading, a leading communist to speak here at a time when that was considered to be extremely dangerous, treasonous speech. And I mean, there was a serious fear that uh, the communists were going to take over the United States, if not the world. I think we have to have that historic respect for the serious fear that people had. And yet he still gave a podium to that, that speech. Mm -hmm. okay. And so probably the, one of the bigger controversies of last year, as you know, was uh, Steve Bannon being invited mm -hmm. to the school. While he ultimately decided not to come, uh, first of all, like, uh, would you have supported the invitation being extended to him? And second of all, uh, there were many students and student groups on campus who felt, as you said, threatened or perhaps uh, disagree with his viewpoints. What would you have suggested they have done had Steve Bannon come to campus? I completely supported the invitation for the reason that he is a significant um, person who has had enormous influence. Many people may think that it was a negative influence, but it was 
indisputably a significant influence on politics and on public policy, and therefore his ideas are ideas that have to be reckoned with. And the more you disagree with those ideas, I think the more important it is to have an opportunity to confront him and to raise your questions and to raise your challenges. I understand that the invitation was for a debate yes. to be moderated by a professor here. So it was not just to give him uh, a platform in which he could spew his ideas, but one in which his ideas would be subject to debate and discussion and questioning. So I completely support that. And I quite frankly, I had so I had such a rosy view of this university as a result of the history and the free speech principles that quite frankly I was really shocked <laughs> when I saw the amount of blowback, as I understand it, about a hundred faculty members signed a petition um, very criticizing the invitation. I understand they uh, did not say it should be rescinded, but a thousand alumni supported, signed a petition that did say that the invitation mm -hmm. should be rescinded. And so I don't understand how they could have gotten a degree from this fine university. <laughs> <laughs> if seriously, I don't mean at all to be condescending. <laughs> I, I understand the deep objection to certain ideas and policies, but uh, it, it, history shows and present experience shows that uh, you're not going to effectively counter ideas by trying to exile them or drive them underground. If anything, that just makes them more potent. Uh, it gives, you know, it treats them, give, gives them the elevated status of being a free speech martyr, which certain elements of the media are very happy to capitalize on. It gains them sympathy. Uh, certainly attention and often sympathy that they otherwise would not have. And uh, I think it makes um, progressives subject to charges of being um, hypocritical, mm. not uh, mm. sincere and consistent supporters of, of liberal values mm. such as free speech. And I think um, sort of along the same vein, um, the, an important question is, you know, how real is the threat of censorship itself? It seems like in recent years we've seen, you know, those demands that certain speakers be deplatformed um, or be disinvited from a campus um, or that social media accounts be banned. Um, but I think, do you see the distinction between censorship and, you know, deplatforming as meaningful? Uh, I would not make a distinction. The, I use the term censorship to refer to suppression of expression based on disagreement with or dislike of its viewpoints. In other words, it's not satisfying that emergency concept. It is solely because of uh, rejection of the idea. And unfortunately, that, that's what deplatforming is about. I don't think there's been, if there were a serious contention that the speaker was going to in, intentionally incite imminent violence or you know, was engaging in a true threat, then the university would be completely justified in calling out the police to suppress the speaker. Um, when we had the situation in Charlottesville, when you have not only people who are voicing repugnant ideas, the ACLU was correct in arguing that that was not a justification uh, for suppressing their speech, and the federal judge was correct in accepting our argument and not suppressing it. But when they're masked with lighted torches and brandishing firearms, that to me crosses the line into a true threat. And as a report that was done by the city of Charlottesville or for the re at the request of the city of Charlottesville afterwards, uh, there was a real failure on the part of law enforcement to use the power that it had at all levels. That report was very critical of the uh, university police and the city police and the state law enforcement for not at that point providing protection against genuine threats. Hmm. So when it comes to these uh, people that uh, espouse uh, hateful things. Uh, when it comes to a person who wants to, say, oppose them through counter speech, 
Would you say that people have a, uh, pe people uh, who are proponents of free speech, do they have a responsibility to engage in counter speech against these individuals? I, I, you take the words out of my mouth, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's, it's a moral responsibility. Obviously, it's not a legal responsibility. <laughs> but uh, precisely because free speech and speech is so powerful, and my argument, as you know, is not at all based on any assertion that oh, sticks and stones can hurt, break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words do hurt, as I said, you know, uh, kind of flippantly with Jeff Stone's criticism. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so my, my initial draft was very hurtful, but in all seriousness, I have been subject to vile anti-Semitic right. speech as well as misogynistic speech. And I actually, you know, one of the harms of hateful speech is not only emotional and psychic, and, that, and that's very real and has physiological manifestations, but it also has a sensorial impact. Um, I remember and literally being stunned into silence by some of the hate speech that's been hurled at me. So I understand um, the, the harmful impact and, and that we do have a responsibility to do whatever we can to reduce both the existence of hateful ideas and expression and to reduce the potential negative impact. And I say potential negative impact because words are different from sticks and stones. Sticks and stones will directly, immediately hurt you by their own force. Words can hurt us only through the intermediating process of the human mind. And we can, you know, why did our parents tell us that old saying? It was so that we would not let the words hurt us, right? We would develop our own pride and self-confidence today. The word that's used is resilience, and social psychologists and other mental health experts say that all of us can learn through cognitive behavior techniques how to uh, make ourselves impervious or you know, relatively impervious to the slings and arrows of, of hateful speech. Uh, but we also have an obligation, even if it's not hurled at us, if it's at anybody else, that we have a responsibility to denounce the ideas and to come to the support of the uh, disparaged persons. I think that those in leadership positions have a real responsibility to do that, including the leadership of universities at mm. the student and, 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 and governance level. And let me say this, I was very surprised when I went back and read, there were a, about you know, three or four path-breaking law review articles that were written in the late 1980s and early 1990s, but interestingly enough, uh, and not coincidentally, all by minority law professors, in which they first made the argument that we should have hate speech codes on college campuses. And it was a very powerful argument that laid out some of the uh, psychological evidence and physiological evidence about the harms of hate speech and saying, you know, we're not guaranteeing true equality of educational opportunity if we admit students who have historically been excluded or marginalized, but then they're subject to all of this hate speech. And, and that was a very powerful argument and evidence which did make the ACLU return to the issue, even though just a little bit more than 10 years earlier in a case from very near here, the famous Skokie case, we had defended free speech for hate speech and we had done that from the beginning. But I think when new arguments are made, of course, people who believe in free speech and free thought should re-examine. So we re-examined our position and came to the conclusion that censorship does more harm than good. But we emphasized a lot of other steps that colleges should take to uh, promote equality and diversity uh, on campus. But going back and rereading those articles, I was struck that every single one of them lamented, even more than hate speech itself, the absence of counter speech. Every single one said, you know, there's no, the media pays no attention to this, nobody on campus says anything, um, and, and therefore you feel completely alienated and isolated. And the initial harm of the hate speech itself is just multiplied many times over 
when the absence of the community to, to react to it, to respond to it, to denounce it. Now, that was 30 or so years ago. We still have enormous challenges in front of us to achieve diversity and equality and so forth. But we have made enormous progress when it comes to counter speech. There is not an incident of hate speech that's not immediately responded to by a chorus of counter speech. University presidents, elected officials, um, students, community members. So that's, you know, it's not just words. It really is making a difference, even from uh, those who advocated hate speech codes in the first place. So what would your recommendation be to a university that wants to introduce some new programs to help its students learn how to counter speech more effectively? Oh, that's a great question. And uh, so there's a lot of research that is being done now uh, by uh, all kinds of social scientists and uh, also by those who are expert in the online world, because this is the forum for the exchange of so much speech, including hate speech and counter speech. And some of the social media companies have actually finance studies by uh, professors and by uh, other experts on what are the most effective strategies for countering hateful ideas and um, stopping people from being persuaded by them or joining hate groups. And the results are uh, that I've read so far are, as is true often of social science, it validates what one might think uh, from common sense that you know, using anger and recrimination might feel morally very satisfying, but it's not particularly persuasive. Uh, certainly, if you're not trying, if you're trying to recruit somebody away from hateful ideas, that um, not surprisingly, reaching out with empathy and compassion for them as human beings is, even though not for their ideas, is very important. Humor, not surprisingly, is a very powerful tool. Um, and online, visual imagery is apparently very, uh, very persuasive, not just words alone. Hmm. Um, so I think another question that is significant in the discussion of counter speech is uh, really how has social media changed, you know, both the landscape or sort of circulation of both hate speech and counter speech, um, and how could um, the nature of counter speech itself in the online sphere adapt in response to um, the presence of social media? So uh, it's, it's a medium, which means that it is a channel for what other people say, and we can use it for good or ill, as has been true of all media of expression throughout time. I think it's very well known how hate mongers have uh, taken to the internet for not only expression, but also for organizing, as in the case of the white supremacist uh, demonstrations in Charlottesville and, and elsewhere. But it's also been a wonderful way to provide information and uh, resources for counter organizing. I just, yesterday is the most recent example. A new report was issued uh, by an organization whose name I'm, I'm going to forget, but it's, a, it's an organization of uh, professionals on campus who specialize in diversity and inclusivity. And um, they did a, they issued what they called a toolkit for universities to deal with incidents of hate speech, either within their own communities or when outside recruit, hate groups come to recruit on campus. And it was you know, very, very detailed information, starting with you know, preventive techniques to crisis management to what do you do after the fact. A year ago, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which for decades now has been specializing in tracking 
hate groups and hate mongers put out another guide specifically for college students, what to do when you learn that white supremacists are coming to your campus, because at that time there was a big movement among them uh, to up their recruitment on college campuses. So even the fact that there's this treasure trove of resources you know, with very concrete steps about what we can do. One of my favorites that somebody brought to my attention was um, what do you do in everyday life in the conversations that I think all of us should have more of when a neighbor or a relative, you know, the proverbial Thanksgiving dinner, somebody <laughs> says something and, mm, you know, how do you respond in a way that's not going to be alienating and off-putting? And it was actually really detailed. It gave specific lines that would be um, most effective and inject you know, a little bit of humor rather than increasing the polarization. So there's, there's a lot positive out there. When it comes to social media, there's a pretty interesting aspect to it that anybody could really use it. I mean, mm -hmm. personal like anecdote, my little sister, who's now just turned nine, has a Snapchat, an Instagram, and a Twitter. I don't know what she's doing on that, but <laughs> um, so seeing as how very young kids are coming onto these platforms, could this speak to a greater need to maybe having programs that from the K through 12 grade level? And if so, do you have any uh, idea? Absolutely. And I mean, we just all need to have increased media literacy. And I say that, you know, for no matter how old we are, um, that, and, and I think one of the, see, I always see the glass half full that comes from being an activist, or you couldn't be an activist without having that, that optimism. All of the uh, information about how much fake news and how much manipulation there is there has made me much more skeptical and wary, which I think is a positive thing. I think all of us, I don't think the media should be denounced in, as an institution. I think that is extremely dangerous in a democracy to you know, create this hostility, the media being the enemy of the people. But I think healthy skepticism of the media, along with government, is, 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 is necessary where we the people are the governors. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to learn how to evaluate sources, to learn how to find sources that are reliable, even you know, so-called fact-checking sources. There are some that are reliable, and there are some that are less reliable. <laughs> Uh, and, and certainly, you know, going back to the issue of equality and counter speech, it is true. One of the advantages of the online media is that you no longer have to be relatively wealthy to have potentially a worldwide audience. So, in that sense, you know, even an individual, as we've seen, very young person uh, can get on social media and have her voice heard around the world. I'm thinking of the, the Parkland students who were so inspiring. Uh, but we do have digital divide, so-called, and so it's really, really important that uh, no matter how poor people are, uh, certainly no matter you know, who they are in terms of, of race or gender or any other demographic characteristic, we have to be sure that they have the education and the access to technology to be able to exercise their free speech rights and uh, including their counter speech opportunities. So sort of um, shifting gears yet maintaining uh, within the realm of the idea of counter speech. Um, a New York Times article in 2017 sort of cited that five teenagers in Virginia drew SWAT stickers um, and wrote words like white power on a historic black schoolhouse. Um, and the teenager's punishment for this crime of vandalism was unique in that um, the judge on the case ruled that each of the five teens should read books from the most, quote, divisive and tragic periods, unquote, um, of history as a means of education, um, and ultimately sort of a way of implicit counter speech. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to know sort of your thoughts mm -hmm. on that mode of counter speech. That's very creative. And right. I thought you were going to ask me, can that be punishable? And I was going to give you a quiz, right? That's vandalism. And it's a hate, it could be a hate crime because right. it was discriminatory. And I do think, again, I give people the benefit of the doubt. 
And uh, as a lifelong educator and advocate, I do believe that people can learn. But uh, let me quote Nelson Mandela, who he said something that Barack Obama tweeted out after Charlottesville, and apparently it was the most widely retweeted of anything in history, even surpassing our president, current president. <laughs> um, but Nelson Mandela said, nobody is born hating other people because of the color of their skin or what they believe. And if people can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. Mm -hmm. I do think that a lot of people uh, are ignorant and insensitive, and that's not to be commended, but it's not the same thing as being an intentional hate monger. I also have seen many examples of where people who do have hateful ideologies have been weaned away through education mm -hmm. and outreach. And one good example is um, Megan Phelps Roper, who was born into this hateful family organization called the Westboro Baptist Church, which had a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, Lola, I'm sure you know about that, that case. Uh, you, you mentioned it um, in our conversation earlier. And um, she was raised in this ideology that hated Catholics and gays and uh, military service personnel. She went online specifically to recruit people to that hateful church, and other people online reached out to her. And through a long process of engagement that is described in an article in The New Yorker, and she's given a TED talk about this, uh, she was recruited away. And um, you know she's, she's lost that family, but she's gained another community. So essentially, you're saying the best way to really breach these insular communities like the Westboro Baptist Church would be to ensure that counter speech is as widely spread as possible? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, I, did, was there any follow-up on what happened to those, those boys? I do not believe, uh, so I, I mean, I first came across the article in the New York Times in 2017. Yeah. I'm not quite sure that there's been sort of yeah. a follow-up article, yeah. but I will it, it be would sure be to very, look into that. It, you know, a couple of weeks ago at the University of Oklahoma, there were two very shocking incidents of, um, in one case online, but in one case in person, uh, somebody on campus wearing blackface and using the N-word, and uh, there was a lot of ferment. And the university president, I think, did the right thing by denouncing the message, saying this is completely inconsistent with the values that we hold dear, but uh, they can't be punished. It's an exercise of free speech. Uh, not surprisingly, there was a lot of pressure on him to expel the students. And interestingly enough, one of the, so I read all these articles about it, and, and, and one statement that I thought was wonderful came from uh, the first African-American professor at that campus. So he was even older than I am, um, <laughs> had, and who had literally worked in the civil rights movement, literally mm -hmm. with Martin Luther King himself. And, and, and he said he was opposing expulsion of the students. He wanted to reach out to them through education. And he said, you know, in the civil rights movement, and they really opposed censorship, and they would go, King and the others would go face to face, even with people who were, you know, literally spewing hatred at them and would encounter hate with love and education. And, and I loved the phrase that this professor used. He said, we would communicate, not excommunicate. Right. Mm. Mm. And so I think with that, we might open up the floor to questions now, I believe, right? Yep. OK, so uh, I guess we're walking around with a microphone if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask. Um, question over here. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming today. Thank you for coming. My name's Parker. I'm also in uh, the first Parhesia class. Uh, I'm a fourth year here. And I have two questions, actually, if that's all right. The first is that you've mentioned a couple times that you think that universities, and it sounds like private institutions in general, should take up what amounts to the Supreme Court's First Amendment jurisprudence in order to have this like broad-based broad discussion. And I guess I'm wondering, 
So my recollection is that in Brandenburg and Skokie, like usually they refer to the First Amendment's protections against the tyrannical government mm -hmm. rather than just sort of protections mm -hmm. against individual mm -hmm. communities or peoples. Mm -hmm. And traditionally that seems to be how the Supreme Court has applied mm -hmm. the First Amendment's protections. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering why you think that that is analogous, analogous and applicable to private institutions it's as well as the government? It's an excellent question. And may I answer that and then your second question uh, separately, Parker? Uh, so it is, t it is literally correct that the First Amendment itself, along with most, almost every uh, rights guaranteeing provision in the Constitution, only applies to government. Most people are really shocked to learn that. So. Here at the University of Chicago, you have no First Amendment rights um, with respect to the university. If you went to the University of Illinois, a state institution, you would have First Amendment rights. But what I advocate uh, is that certain private sector entities have such an important role to play either in furthering free inquiry or stifling it that they should voluntarily choose to adhere to essentially the same principles that they would be required to adhere to if they were public institutions. In fact, the vast majority of private colleges and universities do that. They say as a matter of academic freedom, what we consider to be good for uh, educational opportunities of our students and research opportunities of our faculty, we are voluntarily going to adhere to what would be First Amendment principles if, and obligations if we were a public uh, institution. With respect to um, online, uh, the online world, when I wrote my book, I felt more strongly that it would be really important for them to adhere to free speech principles, um, as I was discussing with my longtime friend and colleague, Larry Strickland, beforehand. I've, I've now convinced that that's unrealistic, that these are uh, businesses, and therefore they have to be concerned about their customer base. They have to be concerned, uh, have economic concerns and concerns about political pressure. So I understand that uh, they will want to create a conducive environment that is free of hate speech or pornography or extremist speech. But I'm still very, very concerned about the dangers of their exercising such powers to enforce such subjective, vague standards. And I think we're all aware of situations. Uh, it's more than a situation. There is a pattern of disproportionate censorship of speech that is critical of government and speech by minority groups and so forth. So I think we as consumers have to, I wish more of us would raise our voices to oppose over-regulation by the social media companies. But anyway, I hope that helps you understand my basis for those arguments. That, that does, absolutely. And I, I was, I was going to ask you actually something separate about obscenity, but mm -hmm. it actually makes me want to ask a follow-up, which is just the, so the way that you've framed free speech, free, free speech on campus and counter speech generally is about it becoming a discussion mm -hmm. and about it becoming convincing people mm -hmm. um, and that that's the value of it mm -hmm. to a large extent. And I guess I'm wondering in the context of places like the University of Chicago where, for instance, the reason that Bannon came isn't that the university said he couldn't come but that he decided not to come mm -hmm. because of the reaction against him on campus. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm wondering, given that there's nobody, I think we'd all agree that there's nobody who can't get access to Bannon's opinions. Everybody mm -hmm. has access to what he has mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. if they want it. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody probably also has access to the things that are said against Bannon mm -hmm. if they want it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he didn't come, therefore, is because of the reaction that he knew he would get from the community on campus, which mm -hmm. is in not allowing him to come to the extent that they have mm -hmm. the ability to not allow mm -hmm. something when it mm -hmm. was his decision, mm -hmm. are really just doing their own act of free speech. Mm -hmm. Why you think it is a bad thing or something that should be uh, understood to be worthy of sorrow that he did not actually end up coming. <laughs> I would not say it's worthy of sorrow. Well, no, but you expressed yeah. it just like you, you, no, you thought it was a bad thing. I don't think it's a great, you know, <laughs> is there a terrible loss? 
No, I don't think so. But I also thought there would have been some benefit if he came. Let me give you an example that um, uh, I recently had experience with that's not so dramatic uh, as a Bannon or a Yiannopoulos, but I think really, for me, showed the value of in-person opportunity to listen to and exchange ideas with somebody you might think that you strongly disagree with or even hate, uh, I'm going to quote somebody in the audience, um, because of a particular viewpoint. I had the opportunity to attend a um, fairly small, maybe 25 people, 20 to 25 people session with former Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. I had never met him in person before. And um, of course, he's been a great hero for civil liberties on some issues and a, you know, an arch enemy on other issues, a very split record. But it was really wonderful to get to interact with him in person and get a sense of an actual human being with humor and with anecdotes and with a life history and you know getting beyond just the opinions that you see when you're you know reading what's discussed on websites and so forth and at the end of that session which went on for about uh, two hours uh, a gentleman said and this was not off the record, I assure you, or I would have uh, not be sharing this. Um, a gentleman said, Justice Kennedy, I am an American Muslim, and I never felt it necessary to in describe myself that way until 2016. I came here pr hating you and prepared to you know, uh, denounce you with anger, and he didn't say it, but what he was referring to was Kennedy cast the deciding vote in the Supreme Court's rejection of the constitutional challenge to the Muslim travel ban. And um, he said, I came here prepared to denounce you and to hate you, but now that I've heard you, I just can't do that. I still strongly disagree with that decision, but I'm putting it in a, in a larger context and understand it differently. So you know, there is that value of an in-person uh, opportunity for exchange. And, you know, and some people, I, I know some people will say, well, why should I have a more human view of a Steve Bannon? Um, well, maybe because it can help you understand why he is so appealing to other people, which might be helpful in trying to dissuade them. I agree with that. I agree with that. George, can I interject? Because I'm I'm so sorry. I it, you I misspoke, obviously. So just let me have an opportunity to clarify my point. I absolutely defend people's rights to oppose inviting somebody and to support disinviting them. That is their exercise of their free speech rights. And to the extent they're banding together with petitions and protests, that's their freedom of association rights. I would, And if somebody tried to silence them, I would oppose that. But I am just saying that there is a negative side to that strategy, right? I'm not saying they don't have a right to do it. Um, but that we have to be mindful of what is lost through exercising our free speech rights that way. Somebody else? Yep. Mm -hmm. 
at that point, it, 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 it's up to HRV to teach different search types. That's what the video we see where we talk about, well, the same letter was used to uh, counter Dr. Marcos to find the Cicero mm -hmm. as the uh, HRV decision on its own. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, there absolutely was physical injury, not only to Heather Heyer, but to the uh, rescue workers who were killed in the helicopter crash. So multiple lives were lost in Charlottesville, but not because of the speech by the white supremacists. Uh, not the speech that they were uh, issuing while they were there. There's a lawsuit pending. There's a lawsuit pending that has raised allegations that there was a conspiracy uh, that was entered into before these people showed up in Charlottesville, and that you know members of the conspiracy somehow um, prodded the driver of the car, and I'm blanking out on his name. He's gotten a life sentence already. Um, but the whether and and if and if if there were if there were material support and conspiracy, then uh, anybody who was part of that should be punished, but not because they were espousing hateful ideas. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, absolutely, uh, completely condemn the ideology of white supremacists in Charlottesville and in Skokie. Uh, to set the record straight, they are not advocating genocide. It doesn't make their ideas any more palatable to me, but it's not genocide. The Nazis in Skokie um, want, had signs that, and the only signs that they had, aside from the swastika, was free speech for white people. So uh, that's not a, you know, even if they advocated genocide, according to the Supreme Court in Brandenburg, that would be protected speech unless they were intentionally inciting imminent violence. Critics of the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think is a. Critics of that movement have accused it of engaging in hate crimes, have blamed the Black Lives Matter movement for have for uh, triggering the assassination of police officers in Dallas. So once we loosen that required direct connection and intent uh, between the speech and the harm, not only ideas that you abhor and that I abhor, but ideas that we support are also going to be vulnerable. Does it? There, there's white, it's like what happened, if you said the sign in Skokie, what happened was they whitewashed the message for public discourse. In fact, you see, you saw that with, uh, there was a, a Nazi, a guy who was part of the American Nazi Party, if, I, if I'm correct on that, mm -hmm. whatever iteration of it was, okay. who ran for... Okay. 
Well, George, I'm ha I, I, let me just, let me can Well, George, I'm, I'm happy to continue talking to you afterwards, but I want to see if other people have a question. And I'll just make one other point to you, which is um, censorship, no matter how well intended, is going to do more harm than good. If we look at the hotbed of Nazism, namely <coughs> Germany in the Weimar Republic, they had very strict anti-hate speech laws, very similar to those that are still enforced in Germany. They were actually enforced, according to the leading Jewish organization at the time, they were enforced fairly. There were prosecutions that were serious. There were many convictions, including of Nazi leaders. And it obviously did not prevent them from rising to power. They gained attention and sympathy they otherwise would not have. So if your goal is, as I hope the goal of all of us is, to prevent a message advocating genocide or any hatred, uh, to suppress it, to, to stop it from having impact and gaining traction. Censorship is not an effective way to do that. So to sum everything up here, is there something Oh, can you do that? Yeah, well, I'll do, at least try, at least try. Um, when it comes to us as students at the University of Chicago, is there anything that we could do as soon as we walk out of here and start moving towards helping to foster an environment that prizes counter speech over censorship? Yes, be very attentive to any situation in which somebody says something that is insensitive or has, involves a stereotype or discrimination and, um, and engage with that person. I think try to do it in a way that is um, not going to alienate that person, but to be helpful and enlightening. Um, you know, it's very hard to say in the abstract because I think everything has to be very situationally specific. But see it as your responsibility because I basically agree with George that an idea can lead to negative consequences, whereas I think a conversation can always lead to very positive consequences. So always be open to both the... Just a second, yeah, no, just a second. And you had a conversation with you guys, would I have not gotten a knife in my head? I'll answer you afterwards. I'm, I'm sorry that's not already clear. Well, great, thank you so much for well, being here. Thank you both thank so, you so much. Excellent so speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>